growing up, we've seen that our clothes and even our siblings' clothes, our mothers would maybe pack them up, put them in a suitcase and say, let's see when another baby comes, whenever they will at least have some clothes when they get here. And it's just that simple thing that there are clothes somewhere. I know whoever has a child has a bag of clothes mm. <laughs> at home that they've mm. put away for a child that's going to come in five to ten years or you don't even know yeah. when that baby's going to come, right? Let's give those clothes to someone. Let's take out at least some of them, then, half of them, and give it to another baby that's already here on earth that needs those clothes. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of the For the Future podcast. In today's episode, I have a really cool conversation with Debo Koratsoma. She is a UCT medical student, and as we talk about in today's episode, she also runs her own nonprofit called Loving Little Feet, which aims to collect clothes specifically for smaller children. So, in today's episode, we really delve deep into this organization, what inspired her to do it, and also how people like us can can help as well. So yeah, hope you enjoy. Okay, so thank you so much, Deboko, for taking the time to come onto my podcast and have a chat with me. I really appreciate it. It's all a pleasure and thank you for, for inviting me. Great. So my very first question for you is, could you please explain to the audience who you are and what is your story? So I am Tebo Horatoma, um, a 25-year-old from this year, um, medical student. And I also founded a foundation called Loving Little Feet. Um, I'm also a mother of one. And yeah, yeah, that's pretty much me. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm a girl born and bred in a township in, in Gauteng called Avery Park. Um, so I'm a medical student at the University of Cape Town. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's 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 quite interesting and it's cool. Um, I'm also a student at UCT currently, uh, but I'm I'm doing engineering, so yeah, that's cool. So you know, you 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 clearly have a, a passion for for helping other people. You know, from studying medicine, as you mentioned, to your foundation, loving little feet. So where where does that passion for helping people come from? I mean, I'd say all my life. Um... I think in school, um, I've always been there as part of the student leaders, as, as the leaders. Um, and obviously, as leaders, you're always helping people, you know. And I, I would really say it's in my nature that I'm just always finding myself helping people. Sometimes I'm not going out to look for people as a leader. Sometimes mm-hmm. just in my personal capacity, I find people contacting me that they need help with anything. And yeah, so it's just always been me that I'm just always helping people, caring about other people, noticing certain things about people and reaching out whenever I, I, I need to. Yeah, that's that's incredible. It's cool to hear that you're kind of just, it's it's almost like a natural presence or a natural thing that yeah. you've always had that, that you've been kind of drawn to helping others. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So could you tell us a bit more about your organization loving little feet like what it is how, what inspired you to to start it and, and exactly how it works okay so maybe let's start with what inspired me so like i said i'm a mother of one so i became a mother and then i saw high mind every now and then we're buying clothes every now and then this baby's overgrowing this clothes mm. and then i asked myself okay i'm lucky enough that we're able to keep up with all of that but what about parents that are not able to do that? Like literally from a small child. Then I started thinking that we usually in the world that we've seen that different organizations focus on school going kids, you know, back to school, uniform, school shoes and all of that. But what about the child that is at home with their parent that needs clothes every day? Yeah. It was during COVID because I had my baby in 2020 just before the COVID um, lock, lockdown level five. Yeah. So then I started then asking myself those questions. Then I started doing some research because a lot of times then a lot of papers were being released. A lot of articles um, were being released. A lot of research was being done regarding the impact of COVID-19 on families, on struggling families. And I read up on a lot of those and that's when I I realized that there is something that I can do about it. And there's something that I can do about it 
it's just a simple thing. Growing up, we've seen that our clothes and even our siblings' clothes, our mothers would maybe pack them up, put them in a suitcase and say, let's see, when another baby comes, whenever, they will at least have some clothes when they get here. And it's just that simple thing, that there are clothes somewhere. I know whoever has a child has a bag of clothes mm. <laughs> at home that they've mm. put away for a child that's going to come in five to ten years or you don't even know yeah. when that baby's going to come, right? Mm. Let's give those clothes to someone. Let's take out at least some of them, then half of them, and give it to another baby that's already here on Earth that needs mm. those clothes. Um, from my research, I mean, I've seen how COVID-19 impacted on primary caregivers. And these caregivers are not just the parents. These are old grannies raising their grandchildren, you know. Who's who's helping those grannies? We know there's the 460 grant, right? It's only 460 per child. But these same families have been, some of them were street vendors trying to sell food on the street for their children to, to get that livelihood for them went away. That means they were only dependent on the grant. So now how are they getting by with just a grant through the winter, yeah. through the summer? Come Christmas, every child, at least there's someone wearing, all the children are playing around, wearing new clothes. What is this child going to wear? You know, children will feel, they feel like they're different from other children. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's when then Loving Little Fit came about and yeah, I finally decided to do something about it after much months, many months of um, research, of, of thinking about it, mm. thinking this is something that I really want to go into because, I mean, I've never been in this kind of a territory. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, I finally did. And we started off with a Christmas drive. So how it works is that basically we ask for pre-loved clothes because that is the main thing that we really need pre-loved clothes, that's all we're asking for. But we are lucky enough that we also get people that say, hey, let me send you money. I don't have a child or maybe I don't have clothes that maybe I've given away those clothes already. Let me send you money. Go do shopping. And we love doing shopping, by the way. Um, so <laughs> we go shopping and um, yeah, we go shopping for these kids. And so basically we get the donations, we get the money. We also then send out to say, hey, can we get clothing requests? With our first time when we asked for clothing requests, we got over 200 requests and we were shocked. Um, and some of the requests, in fact, most of them were outlining their situations at home. And now that's when we realize that there's an emotional aspect of this that we didn't prepare ourselves to. We thought it's just going to be closed. And, you know, and um, yeah, then you have to read stories of people, like how badly the situation is at home and decide, okay, do we still have clothes? Okay. Do we have clothes now to give to this person or not? And, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a huge decision making when it comes to that. But mm. so we get the clothes. If it's pre-loved clothing, we wash the clothes. We wash the clothes. Washing the clothes is to say that we want to make sure that the clothes are in a good condition. They're not dirty. Mm. But we also need to look through the clothes to make sure that everything is still in a good condition. Yeah. We believe that even though these are people from struggling families. We still need to preserve their dignity. So by so doing, we need to give them something that, they, that we would be happy to receive. If I wouldn't be happy to receive that, then I wouldn't give it to someone else. So we look through the clothes, we wash the clothes, then we package the clothes. So we buy packaging, um, nice paper bags that we then package the clothes and try to make sure that at least if we have 10 children or maybe we have clothes that we can divide in two trousers per child, we try to do that at least. Um, so, yeah, we started in 2021, November. Um, so we've just been in existence for just over a year. Um, yeah, mm. so that, that's how we work. And because, I mean, most of us, so it's we are students in our team, we have students and we have, so like our committee, it's students, some people are working. So it means that most of our team members, there's no one that is available like every day throughout the year to work on the foundation and focus on it fully. So this means that we highly depend on our holidays, vacation um, to, to do some work, although we prepare for that when, for like when it's June, 
we know that, okay, we'll be closing maybe university at whatever day. We would prepare for a winter drive so that when it closes, then we are ready. We have clothes. We just work on the clothes and we, we distribute the clothes. Mm. So, um, yeah, so we, we, we do that over holidays. So what we've done, we've done a Christmas drive. Even the last year, this just the one that we just left, um, we had a Christmas drive. So we do Christmas drives. We do winter drives. Those are the main things. And then we also reach out to especially struggling families, um, struggling communities, which would maybe have, um, you know how there's flooding once in a while in mm. Kylie Chair in Ivory yeah. Park, all these townships. Yeah. So if we do have clothes at that time, at that side of the country, and maybe we we were storing those clothes to say we're gonna use them maybe for the winter drive, we then take them out and we sort them out to go help people that have been affected by floods. So we've done that. Um, yeah. So that's that's mainly what we've done, and we've we've so far um, touched around hundred lives, hundred little lives. Mm. So yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's that's absolutely incredible. It's so cool to hear what you guys have been able to do, even just like in the space of one year, how much you guys have been able to to achieve and how many lives you've been able to help. So so that's really cool. Um are you guys based yeah. in are you guys based in, in, in Cape Town or, or where are you based? So at the moment we don't have offices, right? That's yeah. one of the things that we're aiming to have. But um, most of the committee members are in Western Cape, yes. But we also have volunteers in Gauteng. We have volunteers in a committee member in Limpopo. We have um, volunteers in Northwest as well as in KZN. And um, I mean, so what we've also done in the past, even before maybe we've had volunteers in other provinces, um, is that, for example, in KZN, when we started off, we had to send a parcel via PEP. So we just send it via Pep and Pep Pexi and yeah, send it like mm. that. Yeah, no, that's 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 really cool. Um, yeah, like I said, it's really cool to see you guys able to to have such an impact. Yeah. So I mean, and with the impact that we've had um last year, so with just around six months, we were just around six months. Then yeah, then I was um named as one of the. Uh, Mail and Guardian top two hundred young South Africans, mm. um, and I mean that was that came as I can say a shock, but because <laughs> I mean we had mm. just started, and and that just really dated how much impact that we having, and that made us reflect on on everything that we've been doing, and yeah, I mean we see what's happening, we see what we're doing now, and we're happy to continue, no matter how difficult it can be with juggling school. But the kids need to wear something, and we have to yeah. make sure the kids get shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's absolutely incredible. And yeah, you know, I think starting an organization like this for for anyone can be quite daunting, and there might be people out there thinking that you know, I don't know if I'm I'm capable of doing this kind of thing, or I might want to do something, but I don't really know how to start. So. Did you have that kind of 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 fear or or uncertainty and and if you did, how did you kind of um overcome it and and pursue it anyway i mean i did i did, and I know the biggest one that we as people have, especially when you want to start a foundation, is I need capital. Where do I get the capital from mm. and um yeah, I mean, I think i with just reading up and and seeing and I had to come up with ways to say, okay, but do I really need to have a, a place to work from right now? Can't I work with what I have? Can't I work with what people around me have? You know, can't we make a plan at the moment? You know, yes, we don't have a car um, that belongs to our foundation, but maybe someone within us has a car. You know, um, can't we work with that? You know, and see what expenses are going to come up. We we'll work through the expenses as they come up, and we we see what we can do. Um, so I mean, at the end, that's why it, take, it took me so long to to kind of um, launch the foundation, because it was such thoughts that would come up that but but you need money for one two three, but you need money for one two three, and I had to just remind myself that even those foundations that I'm seeing out there that are very much well developed, having everything that I would wish to have for at this moment, they also started somewhere, 
right? And if my starting somewhere means that I start with literally zero pennies in the bank, it's fine. Let's start with zero pennies and then we will we'll work through it. We'll, we'll get through it. And yeah, so that's how we started. And yeah, we just went through it with it. And if capital comes, capital comes. We come with it, we come up with ways to make sure that whatever donations that we get, we know that we have expenses. We need to buy packaging. We need to buy petrol because we need to go deliver in a township, deliver the clothes, right? We can't expect someone to take money for their bread to come get a parcel in Cape Town or somewhere, mm. you know. So we will come to you, but obviously there's a way that we need to come to you. So yeah. It's just that, that, I mean, people started somewhere all along. And I mean, there's, I also just on social media, I would follow people that maybe have other organizations or people that help people with organizations and see the tips that they share that, okay, I mean, you don't have to start with everything. You don't have to start having everything well constructed. Just start and you'll build. Yeah, I think. I think that's definitely a really important piece of of advice and something to think about, especially in, um, at least in things that I've seen in South Africa, that some people are like, oh, you know, you need capital and you need certain things mm-hmm. to start. I mean, mm-hmm. even when I was mm-hmm. even when I was starting this podcast, you know, at first I thought, oh, I have to buy a mic, I have to buy all of these things, but then I thought, you know what, no, let me just open exactly. my camera. Go on exactly. Instagram, send someone a message, and start. And yeah, exactly. I think that's been, I think that's been uh, really impactful for me as well. So yeah, yeah, I think it's 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 really important for for people to understand that if you want to start anything, especially if you want to start doing something that's going to help other people, it's really important to to just start to just go for it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I mean, the, the sleepless nights are not worth it. Like. You have sleepless nights thinking that I could have started. I could Mm. have. You see, you're going about your day and randomly you get a reminder that you have this thought, this idea that you're not implementing. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, just implement it. Just go with it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, I think, especially, I think sometimes you'll, you'll come up with an idea and then you'll have all of these thoughts that prevent you from trying to implement it. And then yeah. a few months down the line, you see someone else and they did like exactly like, the same Ish. thing. And you're like, I could have done that, you know? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's important to understand that you really need to just start with, with what you have. Yeah. Yeah. Just start. So, mm. yeah. so you've, you've kind of mentioned this a little bit already, but, mm-hmm. you know, why did you think that for you pers- like engaging in community development was important to do uh, immediately, almost like urgent to do, especially during the, the COVID-19 pandemic? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how I view it is that, so if it was just me and me being a new mother and I don't think I would have seen it as urgent if it was just me and those thoughts and asking myself how other people are actually getting by, you know, I don't think I I would have seen it as urgent, but research that I did. So that's where I also learned that um, research is important for anything that you want to embark on. It doesn't matter what it is, just mm. research. You know, we see people say research the target market for um, if you want to go into a business, research the target market, research the place that you want to go to and all of that and all of that. But, I mean, with your foundation, it still is important for you to have a deeper understanding of why you have to do this, you know, or of the challenges that you're going to face. I mean, do some research, you know. So the research that I did really, really helped that um, it made it urgent for me because I would see, I remember, I think it was April, there was a study that I saw that was done and it was over April. I think it was April 2021. And it, it revealed that they are, I think it said one in seven children go to bed hungry. You know, and that to me was just like one in seven children in South Africa go to bed hungry because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And obviously these children are most likely getting the child support grant, right? So, I mean, let's give a helping hand. Let me give clothes 
and the parents at least can do something else around the household with the money. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's that's really important. You know, your point on researching something before you go into it really helps you have a, an understanding of the 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 problem and the reality of the problem and helps you be better equipped to solve it. So I think that is really important. Definitely, definitely. So you've been running this organization, as you mentioned, for a little bit over a year. So mm -hmm. what do you think has been the most important lesson that you've learned in uh, running a nonprofit organization? Um, I think that the most important lesson is that there are hidden expenses um, and are only known to you as the person that's running the foundation, right? The people that are receiving the service or the people that are kind of donating into the service, you know, maybe if someone says, let me donate clothes, they don't know about those expenses. They don't know that you need to have washing powder because you need to wash the clothes. They don't know that you need to have petrol because you have to deliver the clothes or have money for pep taxi because you have to courier the clothes. They don't know that you need to buy that packaging. You know, yes, they will see pictures and they look nice, mm. um, but those are costs. And that is not money that is going to come from your pocket because it will not be sustainable for you to say you want to, 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 um, yeah, to, to, to sustain the foundation like that. And I once read somewhere where they said, you need to look at your foundation like a business. You don't have to view it as it's just a foundation, you know, nothing big. It's a business. Yes, it's not generating income for you, but it's generating a service for other people. And therefore, you need to run it as, as such. You need to know that you have your income where you get your, 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 your donations and then you have your expenses before you can render your service to, to, to people. And so that has been like our biggest lesson when it comes to running a foundation. Yeah, I think that's really important and, and practical advice for people who want to run a, a nonprofit that, you know, it's it's important to understand the the practicality surrounding it, you know, the the hidden costs and that sort of thing. So I think yeah, yeah that's that's really important. But that shouldn't make you not start. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Of course. Yes. Yeah. It's just it's just something to be mindful of. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So just just before we wrap up, where can people find you and and support you and your work? Okay, so we are there on social media, Loving Little Fit Foundation, Instagram, on Facebook. And there you will then get all our contact details, our email, our cell phone, if you want. We have a WhatsApp number. Well, our WhatsApp number is mostly used for requests. Um, but I mean, if you maybe want to volunteer, you can also send just send an email um, to us. And yeah, otherwise we'll be. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. And my, my very last question for you is, if you knew that every young African was listening to this podcast episode right now, what would you want to say to them? Um, I'd say to them that there are problems that we all note and all complain about all the time within our country, right? Um, and we are also seeing how things are within our country, the manner in which things are being done in our country. Therefore, if there's anything that you can do about it, do it. Just do it. I mean, our motto at Loving Little Feet is it takes a village to raise a child. And we are that village. To say that um, we understand that there are certain things that maybe the government is trying to do, like child support grant. Um, but otherwise, let us be that village that raises these children. It doesn't have to be a child you know, but let's just help each other out. We know that we have clothes in, the ba in bags Let's get them out, you know, let's help each other. So whatever it is that you seek in the world, if there's something that you can do about it, if there's an idea you have that you can do about it, just do it. And it doesn't mean that for you to make an impact, you have to start the foundation. You can literally do anything. If you feel like, okay, I'm seeing a problem with like pupils at school, maybe drugs, maybe teenage pregnancy, 
I wish I could talk to them, but I need to have a foundation. No, you don't need to have a foundation for that. Just go to that school, talk to those people if you want to do whatever it is that you would like to do. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a really in incredible and important way to end off, you know, the 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 importance of of community and everybody contributing to you know to children and to just helping make this this country and this continent better i, I think that's that's a really important thing to live by and to understand that like no matter future. how big yes exactly for the future for the future of of, of this continent and yeah <laughs> yeah to understand that no matter how big or small these all of these contributions they add up and they really matter so exactly yeah exactly yeah that's really incredible so yeah, yeah. thank you thank you so much Deboho, for for coming in for having this conversation with me it's been really insightful i think that the work that you and your your team are doing is, is really cool and really important and yeah i wish you wish you guys all the best Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Um, and yeah, and thank you for the work that you're doing. I mean, you we get to know about other things that the youth is doing out there through you, you know, and we don't have to know them from the newspaper or somewhere, just on our phone, scrolling on our phone, and we just get to know about them. So thank you. Thank you for the work you do. And I also wish you all the very best with your podcast. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I really hope that you enjoyed it and that it brought you a ton of value. For those of you that have been following this podcast, you'll know that it's something I've been working on for a while. And so it would mean a lot to me if you could please like and subscribe to this channel if you're watching it on YouTube or if you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or any platform like that to follow me, follow my podcast and, and leave a review. But most importantly, could you please, please share if, if you found value from this episode or from this podcast in general and you know other people that could find value from it as well, please share it with them for up and coming podcasts like this one. The, the biggest way for it to grow is through sharing through word of mouth. So every share would, would really mean a lot to me and I would really appreciate that. So yeah, but uh, otherwise, thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next time.